Ethics is a set of moral obligations that define right and wrong in our practices and decisions. Many professions have a formalized system of ethical practices that help guide professionals in the field. For example, doctors commonly take the Hippocratic Oath, which, among other things, states that doctors do no harm to their patients. Engineers follow an ethical guide that states that they hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Within these professions, as well as within science, the principles become so ingrained that practitioners rarely have to think about adhering to the ethic it's part of the way they practice. And a breach of ethics is considered very serious, punishable at least within the profession by revocation of a license, for example, and sometimes by the law as well as scientific ethics calls for honesty and integrity in all stages of scientific practice, from reporting results regardless of properly attributing collaborators. This system of ethics guides the practice of science, from data collection to publication and beyond. As in other professions, the scientific ethic is deeply integrated into the way scientists work, and they are aware that the reliability of their work and scientific knowledge in general depends upon adhering to that ethic. Many of the ethical principles in science relate to the production of unbiased scientific knowledge. What is known as prior knowledge or pre-existing knowledge is the knowledge, skill or ability that a learner brings to a new learning encounter. This includes all knowledge that is available before the learning event, and which has been gathered or developed by any means, and in any situation, including both formal and, quite often, informal learning situations. Learners need enough previous knowledge and understanding to enable them to learn new things. They also need help making links with new and previous explicit knowledge. It is considered to be valuable to go through a process of what has been called activating prior knowledge. Teachers often go through this process at the beginning of a new topic. They also use introductory strategies at the beginning of lessons which are continuations from previous lessons. In terms of the practicalities of teaching, this is a process of making children think about the topic or remember what has been covered already. In terms of theory, it is to do with activating particular schemas. His product life cycle has four very clearly defined stages, each with its characteristics that mean different things for businesses that are trying to manage the life cycle of their particular products. Introduction stage This stage of the cycle could be the most expensive for a company launching a new product. The size of the market for the product is small, which means sales are low, although they will be increasing. On the other hand, the cost of things like research and development consumer testing, and the marketing needed to launch the product can be very high, especially if it's a competitive sector. Growth stage The growth stage is typically characterized by strong growth in sales and profits, 
and because the company can start to benefit from economies of scale in production, the profit margins, as well as the, the overall amount of profit, will increase. This makes it possible for businesses to invest more money in promotional activity to maximize the potential of this growth stage. Maturity stage During the maturity stage, the product is established and the aim for the manufacturer is now nowadays onto one market share they have built up. This is probably the most competitive time for most products and businesses need to invest wisely in any marketing they undertake. Current research into the nature of the relationship between participation in physical activity, sport and educational performance has produced mixed, inconsistent and often non-comparable results. For example, some cross-sectional studies illustrate a positive correlation between participation in sport and physical activity and academic success, e.g., maths, reading, acuity, reaction times. However, Critics point to a general failure to solve the issue of direction of cause, whether intelligence leads to success in sport, whether involvement in sport enhances academic performance, or whether a third factor, e.g. personality traits, explains both. Longitudinal studies also generally support the suggestion that academic performance is enhanced, or at least maintained, by increased habitual physical activity. Yet such studies are criticized for not being definitive because some do not use randomized allocation of pupils to experimental and control groups to control for pre-existing differences. Others tend to use subjective teacher-assigned grades to assess academic achievement rather than standardized and comparable tests, and some programmers include parallel interventions, making it difficult to isolate specific effects. The area that is now South Africa has been inhabited by humans for millennia. The San, the original inhabitants of this land, were migratory people who lived in small groups of about 15 to 20 people. They survived by fishing and hunting and by gathering roots and other wild foods. They did not build permanent dwellings but used rock shelters as temporary dwellings. Around 2000 years ago Khoikhoi pastoralists migrated to the coast. In the eastern part of present-day South Africa, iron working societies date from about 300 AD. The Botswana and Nguni peoples arrived in this region around 1, 200 AD. They lived by agriculture and stock farming, mined gold, copper and tin and hunted for ivory and built stone-walled towns. Over the centuries, these societies had diverse contacts with the Khoisan. Strife between the San and the Khoikhoi developed over competition for game, eventually the Khoikhoi became dominant. These peoples lived in the western part of present-day South Africa and are known collectively as the Khoisan.
Asda has become the first food retailer in the country to measure how much customers can save by cutting back on food waste, thanks to a knowledge transfer partnership KTP with the University of Leeds. The idea behind the KTP was for the university, using Asda's customer insight data, to apply its research to identify, investigate and implement ways of helping customers to reduce their food waste. This was one of the first times that a major retailer had tried to deliver large-scale sustainability changes, with the two-year project seen as a way for Asda to position themselves as true innovators in this area. The campaign focused on providing customers with advice on everything from food storage and labeling, to creative recipes for leftovers. Meanwhile, in-store events encouraged customers to make changes in their own. They will make changes to how they deal with food waste in their own homes, leading to an average saving of £57 per customer, as well as a reduction in waste. A key aspect of a KTP is that an associate is employed by the university to work in the firm and help deliver the desired outcomes of the KTP. As a part of the collaboration with ASDA, Laura Babs was given the task of driving forward the sustainability changes in the retailer. As a result of the success of her work, Laura eventually became a permanent member of the team at ASDA. It might seem a little eccentric, but reviewing your work by reading it aloud can help to identify the woolliest areas. This works best if you perform your reading in a theatrical way, pausing at the commas and ends of sentences. If you run out of breath during a sentence, it is probably too long. You ought to be able to convert your writing into a speech in this way if it sounds too stilted and convoluted, perhaps you could rework these parts until they sound fluid. It is unlikely that your reader will be fooled by the idea that long words make you sound clever. Cluttering a sentence with too many complicated words can prevent its meaning from being understood at all. A short word is always preferable to a long one. Why should anyone choose the word erroneous over the word wrong in an essay? Usually, writers who employ more obscure words are trying to sound impressive but can appear pretentious. Direct words enable you to control what you are saying, and are not necessarily babyish, but the most appropriate ones for the job. When you read your writing aloud, you will notice that the key stress comes at the end of your sentence. It is, therefore, most effective to end with a short and emphatic word to secure your point. Try to resist the impulse to waffle at the end of your sentence by trailing off into qualifying clauses.